Hi, I'm Lou from Dividends Dog. Thank you for joining us. So here we talk about stocks, especially dividends paying stocks. So if that's your kind of thing, please like and consider subscribing. So usually what we do is we focus on one stock and try to analyze it. Uh, in light of the recent uh, bank failures, uh, we're gonna change up the format a bit uh, we'll be looking at the bank sector, uh, the banking as a sector rather than just one individual stock. So as many of you already know, uh, there's been three banks that have collapsed recently. Uh, the first was Silvergate Bank. Uh, they were more into the crypto space. Uh, and then the Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, that was a big uh, bank that primarily was into funding businesses and startups and tech companies. Uh, and then Signature Bank, which is another uh, bank that was also big into the crypto space. So, uh, yes, I would consider it a crisis, uh, regardless of what politicians might say. Uh, I know people are still on the fence. Is it a crisis? Is it not a crisis? Uh, things could get worse. Things could get better. Uh, but I would say right now we're sort of in a crisis for the banks. Uh, in the in the wake of all this wreckage, other banks have seen their their stocks get pummeled across the board. So, as a dividends investor, I started to look around and think: Are there any great buys out there? Any bargains to be had? Uh, the trouble is, as we look through this, is how to separate the strong banks from the weaker banks. You know, the, the knee-jerk answer to that is to look at the bank size. Um, that might work for only the truly giant money center banks that are too big to fail. Uh, you know, they're so big that they would jeopardize the whole entire economy of our country, and then the government won't let them fail. But, I mean, out of the thousands and thousands of banks, I think that's probably only holds tr uh, true for probably three, four, maybe five banks total that would be that big where the government won't let them fail. So, you know, looking at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, it was not small. It, it was had about $200 billion worth of assets. So it was pretty big. Uh, I think it was like the 16th largest in the nation. So a pretty big bank. So basically looking at, at um, looking at size isn't really gonna help us much here. And then I remembered there's this one smallish bank uh, that prided itself on being the strongest bank in California. Uh, not the biggest, but the strongest. And that's uh, F. MBL Farmers and Merchants out of Long Beach. It's mostly a family-owned bank by the Walker family, and shares trade for like six thousand dollars each on the over-the-counter market. But um, I wanted to get more of a sense of what metrics they use to call themselves the strongest, so I could use that and apply that against other banks. Uh, they say a lot of things. Um, you know, as you read through all the disclosure numbers. So looking a step back for a second, in, in the wake of all the bank failures back in 2007, 2009, uh, Basel III came up with all these metrics to define what an adequate bank was and what a, quote, well-capitalized bank is. So there's four, there's four different metrics here that we'll take a look at. Uh, the first is the total risk-based capital ratio of at least 8% to be considered adequately capitalized and be at least 10% to be well-capitalized. And the higher the number, the better. The second is Tier 1 risk-based capital ratio, so at least 6% for adequate and at least 8% for well-capitalized, uh, higher the better. The third is the Common Equity Tier 1 Capital, or CET1, ratio, at least 4.5% for adequate and at least 6.5% for well-capitalized. The higher, the better. And the last and fourth one is the Tier 1 Leverage Ratio, 
So at least 4% for adequate, at least 5% for well-capitalized. The higher, the better. So basically, if we can't rely on a big bank size here, uh, we can look at these four ratios to compare banks on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. Uh, I'm not a bank expert uh, analyst by any means, uh, but it seems like these four numbers, the higher the better is the way to compare banks. So what I did was I created a spreadsheet for a bunch of banks. Um, by the way, also keep watching. And I'm going to also go through to a couple of the ones that failed uh, at the end. So looking at the sheet here, uh, the first four are the giants, the, some of the money center banks and then the larger, the larger regional banks, and then some of the medium, smaller banks uh, that have gotten hit hard, some of them, a few others I just picked at random. Uh, there's three notes on the spreadsheet. Uh, the first note, I had to go through a lot of different 10K filings, presentations, bank disclosures to find this data. So while I tried to be as accurate as possible, uh, I do not guarantee the accuracy of this. Uh, the second note is some banks reported different numbers for their ratios, uh, corporate numbers versus the actual bank subsidiary numbers. Uh, others use uh, that plus numbers when things like when it's fully phased in versus in transition numbers. So basically looking at all this, you know, some of them had two numbers, some had four numbers. I'm, I'm looking at you. Wells Fargo. <laughs> I, what I did was to try to keep this consistent, I used the lowest ratio number given. Uh, remember, the higher the number, the better in each of these categories. So I think I was being extra, extra conservative here. Uh, but some of them were real son of a gun to figure out. So I guess there were a few of them other than Wells Fargo, and I want to just pick on one bank. But there were a few, a few other ones that were kind of tough. Third disclosure, uh, third note is just my disclosure here. I own shares in FMCB. Uh, that's also just so happens to be called Farmers and Merchants Bank Corp. Uh, that's different than the Farmers and Merchants that we talked about earlier. And I also own a couple shares of M&T Bank. Okay, so let's get into this here. So of the four giants here on the top, uh, JP Morgan Chase looks to be leading the pack. It, it's best in three of the four categories. So it's also the biggest US bank, uh, but its stock hasn't really been hit that much because people all know that. Uh, of the largest regional banks, uh, M&T has the highest numbers of, the, of this grouping in all four categories uh there's not not much of a surprise there it's kind of known to be a strong bank uh the regionals and smaller banks uh, so farmers and merchants of long beach the fmbl it has the highest numbers of the group uh, in fact three out of four categories it's the highest of all the banks i looked at here so I guess they do earn their title of the strongest bank in California that they proclaim. Uh, I see Independent Bank, uh, that's out of Massachusetts. There's a lot of other banks called Independent, but Independent Bank here looks pretty good. Uh, some of the banks here on the list that have gotten hammered, uh, First Republic stock uh, has, has suffered a lot recently. Uh, so the numbers are not as strong in most categories, but I actually expected worse the way the stock was getting beat up uh, so much. I thought the numbers were gonna be awful. Uh, same same with these other uh, stocks that have gotten hurt pretty bad. Uh, Western Alliance, uh, let's see, Zions, uh, Comerica. So, you know, people, this brings up a question here, looking at all these numbers, you know, we get the sense that, you know, you know, we can, we, uh, the big banks, the uh, J.P. Morgan looks better than the other, you know, three out of the four categories. It looks better than the other three. And so, I mean, we can all, you know, some of these are kind of, we're, we're slicing hairs here, it seems. But um, it brings the question up here. Okay, so you can do all this and you can do all this for 
many other banks, but so how did Silicon Valley Bank and the others that collapsed, well, what did their numbers look like? So for Silicon Valley, I put up the numbers for the corporation and the bank uh, separately just to get a better sense of this and also for Signature Bank. Now, my first impression was, uh-oh, um, their Basel III stress test numbers were good. So actually, they were very good. So when we look at these numbers, um, their numbers were better than a lot of the operating banks. In fact, Silicon Valley Bank was lauded as one of the quote-unquote best banks by Forbes. Uh, Value Line assigned them an A rating for financial strength, and they had also assigned a B++ to Signature Bank. Uh, Moody's, the rating agency, had Silicon Valley uh, at an A3 rating. S&P had it at a triple B minus rating. Those are investment grade ratings. So the rating agencies and the investment publications, uh, they all thought Silicon Valley Bank uh, was strong. And they thought this right up to the very end here until it, it collapsed. So it brings up a whole other question. Where does that leave us as investors? I, I honestly, looking at this, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I'm not an expert at rating banks. Uh, you probably aren't either. But um, we shouldn't feel too bad. You know, all the experts whose job it is to sit there and rate banks, and this is what they do for a living, and they, they all got it wrong too. So I, I think the two lessons here to be learned in all of this is that the first lesson is that banks, banks are notoriously difficult to analyze. You know, they can make a lot of money, they can pay out a lot of dividends, uh, but you can't, you can't always trust that their asset base uh, is sound. I, I thought at the beginning that um, I found a good way to compare banks, to weed out the lousy ones from the strong ones. Uh, and, you know, as we saw, you know, it started looking promising as I went down the list from, from giant banks to regional banks. It looked like it was, you know, about matching my expectations. Uh, but I was proven incorrect when looking at the numbers of Silicon Valley uh, Bank and also Signature. Uh, in, in theory, uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, investing so much into treasury bonds uh, that they couldn't sell in a panic uh, looked, you know, it, it looked safe at the time. Uh, the, the funny thing is that treasuries, treasuries are safe investments. Um, I mean, you always have interest rate risks, but, um, you know, all this is very ironic. Um, you know, the collapse, uh, looking at what happened to the treasuries, you know, they had a, all these people coming in at once. They had to end up selling their treasuries to pay them. Naturally, we know interest rates have, have, have risen. So basically, the price they could get for their treasury notes and bills and bonds were less. Um, it, it's all of this is just very ironic since the collapse of the banks, those three banks, uh, the prices of treasuries actually went up uh, and the yields went down. And um, that's why th this is what forced them to sort of uh, take a loss. If they could have just held on to those treasuries, they would have been they would have basically been made whole. They would have got the full face value of the treasury bills and bonds. Uh, but they didn't have the luxury of doing that. You know, it became a, a cycle of people coming in for their money now to withdraw it. So they were forced to sell at an inopportune time. Um, I think that that's kind of leads into the second lesson to all this, that almost, I think almost any bank will fail if enough people uh, lose confidence and they start demanding their money all at the same time. Almost any bank, I, I, I think probably all of these banks that that, that could happen to. Um, so I don't know what the answer to this is, you know, on a big scale. I don't know. I mean, where did they go from? They had Basel 3. Was, did they go to Basel 4, Basel 5 to come up with new regulations? I, mean, I don't know if the regulations, I don't know if 
I mean, we can look at basal three and all these ratios that I thought that would help us kind of weed out the good from the bad. It didn't really work this time. So I, I don't see what else they can really do here. Um, on the big scale, I mean, looking at just the United States, um, it's really a shame who's going to lend to these startups. You know, these tech firms, all these startups from Silicon Valley and uh, the rest of the country, the rest of the world even. Um, you know, regular traditional banks. We're not the kind of bank that wants to lend to these companies. So I think, unfortunately, it really, you know, going forward now that we've lost Silicon Valley Bank, uh, this could really hurt the United States as a, as a country uh, when we have these people who are entrepreneurs that are trying to start these these new tech companies. So it's, it's really, it could end up hurting us for years to come. I think I remember, I saw somebody on one of the networks who was an analyst saying that, well, you know, this set us back 10 years and, you know, maybe the long game, maybe they'll be correct about that, but I hope not. But for me, as, a, as an investor here looking at this, um, this, this is basically the reason why uh, I never made bank stocks a major part of my portfolio. Uh, you know, I, I may, and I might buy some, some of these beaten down bank stocks, uh, but just as a speculation and not put too much money into any particular one bank stock. Um, I, I don't think they're all going to just go out of business the way these three banks. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess you never know, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. So there's probably money to be made here. And uh, by the way, uh, goes without saying, but this is not financial advice, just my opinion. Uh, and we'll have to see what, what, what comes of this here, whether more banks will fail or everything will stabilize. And by next month, everybody will forget all about this. I don't know. What's, what's your opinion? Please leave your opinions, thoughts, uh, comments. Thank you for watching. Be safe. Have a good day.